a welcome back. In recent weeks, a documentary surfaced on the internet on the mainland. The documentary, called Silent Contest, was made by China's National Defense University for the People's Liberation Army and has led some people to ask whether the administration actually wants to create a new Cold War with the West. This is the United States National Defense University, the This is the United States National Defense University, the 这样庞大的规模在两个国家的驻外总领馆中极为罕见。大量资料表明，这两个总领馆的职能早已超出了国家外事范围。他们不仅长期对我香港内部事务实施干预，而且已成为了半公开的反华反共前沿基地。七一游行those were among the views presented in silence contest, which also labeled among the mainland's enemies and destabilizing forces, the Dalai Lama and the Uyghur democracy activist Rubia Kadir. For a while, that documentary appeared on mainland websites and attracted a considerable amount of ridicule from Chinese web users. It has gradually been removed from all internal websites. But does the removal suggest that there are still strong divisions among senior levels of the Chinese Communist Party? That's the question analysts have been asking. Being mobbed on the internet is not an experience the Chinese leadership much likes. And in a reported August speech by Xi Jinping, the Communist Party chief, he took a hard line on controlling the internet and ordering the party's propaganda machine to build a strong army to seize the ground of new media. And there are indications that the crackdown is going beyond mere words as censors are tightening control on the internet, shutting down websites for rumor mongering and silencing outspoken social media commentators. Well, given the rhetoric of silent contests and Xi Jinping's recent hardline comments on controlling the Chinese internet, is the country spiraling towards a new age of Cold War rhetoric, or are the attempts to backpedal on these issues a sign of the struggle within the country's top echelons? With us in the studio are David Zweig, who is the director of the Center on Transnational Relations at the University of Science and Technology, and veteran China watcher, Willie Lam. David Zweig, can I come to you? Is this your view? Do you think that, that, that the Chinese government's policy now is becoming a more kind of Cold War policy? The, the, whether there's a Cold War mentality, um, uh, I'm not sure I would take it so far. I think, I think that there's, two, there's a, it's sort of a two-fisted policy. Right? On the one hand, there's a desire to placate the, the internal nationalists. I think Xi Jinping's view of China Dream says it's a great country, it's large, it should have more influence. But I think on the other hand, we hear voices saying, look, you know, th this makes things very difficult. If we want to get along with the s countries of Southeast Asia, we have to make more concessions. We have to find out ways to negotiate. We recently had a, um, a, a guy I thought was a hardliner come down here to give a talk in Hong Kong, and he, in public, complained about o excessive hardline policies. So, I, you know, I wouldn't say it's all one way. I think it's a you know, two-sided policy here. Well, I guess that, that, that there are different voices within the policy establishment in, in, in China. I think um, it's not surprising that the uh, the POA generals, there are quite a few who um, have 
personal, uh, good personal connection with Xi Jinping, who are advocating a, a, a more uh, aggressive, um, high power projection. But at the same time, I think uh, there are more supposedly uh, rational advisors who are advocating using, um, for example, economics based uh, diplomacy. So that's why, uh, for example, in the recent visits made by Xi Jinping and Liu Keqiang to the uh, Southeast Asian countries, I think they're emphasizing uh, economic cooperation, infrastructure cooperation, and so forth. So I think this um, double fisted policy will, will go on. For but the time can I being. just ask you about Hong Kong? Because specifically in this this clip that we've just seen, you 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 hear them referring to people who are opposed to the Hong Kong government's policy, the Occupy Central people, as being tools of foreign agents. That seems to me to be a slightly different approach. You know, all opposition is illegitimate than we've heard before. Well, it's true. I, th I think it's an uh, exacerbation of a familiar uh, conspiracy theory. I think even at the time of Deng Xiaoping. Uh, there were references made in internal discussion uh, within the CCP that Hong Kong might become a, uh, a front line uh, uh, for uh, hostile uh, anti-Chinese forces uh, trying to subvert the, uh, the mainland uh, social disorder. And recently, of course, there's been talk about this uh, separatist movement in Hong Kong and so forth. So that's why uh, the People's Study Overseas Edition recently run, ran an article saying that the Occupy Central Forces represent a uh, force of extremism, which is a term they would usually use for separatists in Xinjiang and Tibet. So I think uh, the conspiracy theory that somehow the, the CIA is behind the Occupy Central Movement uh, is it's an entrenched uh, uh, notion within certain elements of the leadership. But, but it doesn't mean that they would continue you know, to use only uh, tough tactics. Uh, at the same time, they're also pursuing uh, softer uh, united front tactics against some of the uh, uh, players in Hong Kong. It, it's important to remember, um, it was always shocking to me, that after the 2003 protest march, I, th I think the guy's name was Gao Suwen, he was the leader of the liaison officer number two, publicly said that everybody who, he knows, he knew that everybody who participated in the march got a hundred US dollars from the American consulate. First of all, the consul general said he wished he had that much money. That's a lot of money, 500,000 people. You give everybody 100 bucks. Um, I participated the second year. I didn't get any money. Um, but uh, the, the fact that a leader, in a, a representative, an official representative of Chinese government can stand up in public and say something that is clearly untrue for the purpose of propaganda and accusing the Americans of subverting and undermining the, the, the Hong Kong government and undermining China's con control here. That, I mean, that's, that's really silly. Um, uh, it, it calls into question sort of the veracity of what the Chinese government says. Uh, and I think that it, you know, it reflects back um, into this, this video that we're, we're going to be talking about, that, that, we, that they can say outlandish things, outrageous things, um, and, and, and think that it's okay. Uh, we've got this uh, meeting coming up, this important meeting of the Central Committee. Is, is there any real sign, other than the usual straw in the wind, that there's a big power struggle going on? between the so-called liberals and the so-called uh, hardliners. Well, will I, we see any of that? Well, this? I guess um, they will publish a, an a ambitious economic reform blueprint. So I, I think there's a uh, reasonably high degree of consensus within the leadership uh, across the political spectrum that even though on ideological political matters uh, there might be some signs of even a restitution of, of Maui's values. I think on, on the economic front, I think there's a consensus that they, they have to move uh, uh, towards the market. That means uh, bringing in more market forces and curtailing some of the uh, state uh, control over the economy, for example. Uh, there's talk about a, a high degree of um, privatization of the four major commercial banks. There's talk about um, Land privatization. Yeah, privatization and, and also allowing farmers to sell their pieces of land uh, so, as, so that they can move to the cities and, and uh, boost consumer spending, which uh, the leadership agrees is very important because they cannot rely for effort on exports and on government investments to jack up a GDP growth rate. So I think there's a reasonable degree of consensus to, okay, to move Okay, that's the, the economic place. front. What no. do you expect to be seeing on the political front well, from well, here? I think a lot of the economic policies that, that Willie's talking about actually have serious 
political ramifications. I mean, the, the vested interests, right, that we talk about. I mean, I don't see it so much as a left, right, or liberal, conser you know, conservative conflict. I agree with Willie. I think there's probably consensus out there. Um, um, so, so that's, you know, I don't see it so much as that, as that kind of power struggle. And I think that one of the things that always strikes me about this meeting is that Xi Jinping's done remarkably well in terms of strengthening his hand. Nobody thought last year um, in October that he was going to be able politically to have the power to drive forward this probably this reformist document at the third plenum. The one thing I will say about politics, and then I'll let you in, Willie, um, is that one thing that we've heard about, and I'm not sure if it will really happen, is a separation of the courts and local governments. We've seen that discussed. And, and there seems to be a concern that local state in China is just too powerful. And they can use the courts to steal land, to do all, you know, the corruption drive. These guys get away with it because they control the courts. And so we've actually seen, doc, you know, sort of rumors, but articles, reports in the press in Chinese saying that they're going to separate this. If they can pull that off, that's a big deal. Yeah, there will be some movement on, on, on legal reforms. Uh, even the perhaps the uh, discussion about the abolition of the Lao Gai, you know, this reform through labor uh, regime and so forth. Uh, and, and, and certainly, I think um, uh, we have to bear in mind that regarding uh, economic financial reforms, I think uh, Xi Jinping has talked about striking the right balance between reform on the one hand and stability on the other. So I think uh, apart from uh, bringing in market-oriented changes, I think they would also need to care, to care about uh, maintaining uh, economic growth. 7.2% uh, uh, would be the minimum, as, as uh, Li Keqiang said. And also, uh, Xi Jinping uh, is also um, conscious about maintaining uh, the party state apparatus over some sectors of the economy. But I'm going to have to, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're going to have to wind it up here. Thank you both very much indeed. We'll see you at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye.